welcome back to the second portion of this uh, lecture. Uh, we have so far been talking about uh, examples of uh, univariate uh, type of linear regression model, which um, drew a relationship between two, only two variables, right? One dependent and one independent variable. Now, of course, so what we want to do here is to scale up, right, this approach to, uh, to now developing a relationship between a dependent variable and several, right, several uh, uh, exogenous variables, okay? And, and so this is known as multiple uh, regression analysis, okay? And again, we, we would be essentially assuming, right, in, in this uh, example, in this approach, that there is this uh, a linear relationship between the dependent or our endogenous variable and, uh, and the and, uh, exogenous variables now. So we will change now the notation a bit. So uh, of course, why is still uh, denoting the dependent variable, that's still y. But now instead of having x, only one x in the, in the exogenous variable, we'll have multiple. So we can, we can have now as many uh, exogenous variables as possible. It can be two, uh, it can be up to n, right? So then, uh, but the approach is still fundamentally the same uh, in terms of how you represent the model. In other words, you still have your uh, constant. You start with what if all of those uh, exogenous variables were to be zero? And then, I mean, uh, if the, their coefficients were to be zero, uh, what would be the value of y? That's the intercept. That's the constant. So that's still our beta zero. We're still going to keep it there. But now you have each exogenous variable associated with one coefficient. So beta one for x1, beta two for x2, beta three for x3, et cetera, all the way to beta n for xn. And of course, we still have our uh, error term or residual, okay, which again measures the uh, proportion of the dependent variable uh, not explained uh, by the, the various uh, exogenous variables that we have uh, included in the model, okay? So, let's go to, now when you have multiple regression, we need to make uh, additional, additional uh, assumptions. Um, uh, one additional assumption is the assumption of no multicollinearity. Okay, so what is this assumption saying? This assumption is saying that there will not be, by assumption, uh, a high level of correlation between the exogenous variables, okay? So, of course, we want, we want it to be a high degree of correlation between the exogenous variables and the dependent variable. Of course, that's what we want. But what we don't want is among the exogenous variables themselves on the right hand side of the model, right? All this, the, the, the X is here. We don't want them to be highly correlated, okay? Because if they were, if among the exogenous variables, there's a high degree of correlation, uh, these can cause issues when you are estimating the model in terms of interpreting the results, 
the power of the model to be able to identify uh, exogenous variables that are significantly significant, uh, uh, that are sig statistically significant in the model, uh, that power of in the model will be very reduced because if among the exogenous variables you have a high degree of correlation, uh, then you don't know which one might be uh, affecting, impacting uh, the, uh, the dependent variable more. Okay, so it will be very difficult to differentiate the impact, right? The uh, uh, associated attributed to uh, each one of those uh, exogenous variables. Okay, so usually the way you will detect multicollinearity is to see uh, uh, whether you know there's high, high standards error for regression coefficients, okay? Uh, whether there is um, an overall model uh, significance, your R square, your F statistics, but that you don't have significant coefficients. And, and you can understand that. If you have high degree of collinearity, uh, the multiple collinearity, then of course, what would happen is that uh, the model may be, may be showing that you put all these variables on the right-hand side and you, you come out, the results show that, oh yeah, yeah, yeah your R square is, uh, is very high. Uh, your F statistics is, uh, uh, is uh, significant, okay, but then, your T statistics associated with each of the coefficients are, are very low. Uh, so you don't know, and that makes sense because it's very difficult in that sense to differentiate, as I said before, uh, the, uh, the impact of each exogenous variable in the presence of uh, high correlation among them, okay? And so we can also look at whether when you add uh, other exogenous variables, if there's a large uh, uh, impact in the coefficients, the coefficients of those uh, variables that are already in the model, then you should start, uh, uh, you should start suspecting, okay? You should start suspecting multiple collinearity or your coefficients have signs that are opposite to what you would expect from theory, okay? Uh, you know, so we might expect, for example, from theory that if you're adding fertilizer to land, uh, that the yield will go up, okay? That's a, that's a reasonable expectation. Fertilizer, more fertilizer per uh, uh, plot of land, uh, we, we can assume reasonably that uh, yield would go up. But if you are, if you are uh, in a regression where you have data on those variables by right, yield, let's say corn yield, uh, you have land, you have fertilizer and so on, and then added fertilizer means that uh, you see that the yield uh, may be going down, then you might be suspected. Is there anything else in the model that is taken away from uh, or the impact of fertilizer you know, in my model that I should check out um, just to make sure? Usually we test for multicollinearity by using what's known as variance inflation factor. Again, you will get this from the, uh, the package uh, the regression package, whichever one that you use. Uh, so each exogenous variable would can you can request for the variance inflation factor. Uh, and usually you look at the variance inflation factor if it's between one and four, uh, then there's likely no multicollinearity. If it's getting to 10, you should start suspecting multi, uh, multicollinearity. If it's greater than 10, then of course, then you know for sure there is multicollinearity. 
So the variance inflation factor is an important, uh, an important indicator, okay, of uh, the presence or not of uh, multicollinearity. So this is an assumption that we didn't make before in the case of a univariate uh, model because there was only one exogenous variable. So we didn't have to worry about multicollinearity. Uh, but uh, when you have two or more uh, exogenous variables, if you don't choose them very well, so this is what is the lesson here is how you choose your variables is important that you include in your model. You want to be careful, uh, you know, uh, not to choose variables that are already correlated, you know, one with the other, okay? Um, and, and, uh, and including in the model, right? So let's see, this is just a one example of a multiple, multiple regression. We are going to, uh, we are going to here want to measure uh, the uh, performance, the weekly performance of uh, uh, employees based on based on uh, two characteristics: intelligence, extroversion. So you already have more than one uh, exogenous variable. Okay, um, your uh, weekly sales performance, that, that is your performance, right? So that's the last column, right? So, so the, the weekly sales, and then you will, your sales person, the first column uh, will give you uh, essentially the, that's the number of employees, so one to 20. Each one associated uh, has, we measure their intelligence, it's not important how this is measured in, uh, in our discussion. You just have numbers here. These are just numbers. Uh, and then a measure of whether or not they are extrovert or not, right? Um, so you, of course you have people who are very intelligent, but may not be extrovert, maybe more introvert. And uh, you have people who may not measure up to the what you might say the most intelligent maybe in terms of how you measure this. And, uh, but they are very extrovert, right? They are people's people, okay? People's persons. And so uh, one might ask, uh, when you look at the combination of these two characteristics, which one is more important determinant of performance? Okay, which one is uh, more significant determinant of performance, okay? This is what we are asking, all right? So what is uh, the model? The model is, we will say performance, okay, is equal to uh, beta naught is our constant. Now we have a beta one times intelligence, INT for intelligence, beta two times uh, extra extroversion, so I just put extra here, and plus the error term, always in, uh, in the conceptual uh, model, you always wanna have your error term, uh, as I explained before. There's no way that one model, conceptually theoretical model can capture everything happening in the world. Okay, so what we want to do is uh, now essentially apply the same methodology, the OLS methodology, which is that you could use uh, for regression analysis uh, that you can download from the, uh, the internet, R or Greto and other, uh, other search uh, packages, okay? And then we can look at the, uh, as we did before, the ANOVA, the analysis of variance, goodness of fit, uh, test, uh, test the different uh, assumptions uh, and perform uh, uh, hypothesis testing uh, and, then, and then see how, what kind of conclusion, what kind of inference can we draw after we've gone through all those steps to make sure to make sure that we are uh, crossing our T's and dotting our I's 
in terms of statistics analysis. Okay. So here's the, uh, when I estimate the model with this data, okay, uh, here's uh, what the results show, okay. So what you should, this should look familiar to you. Uh, you have the column, the coefficient column, the constant is here positive, 993. Okay, intelligence, of course we have 20 uh, observations. Okay, using OLS, the dependent variable is sales per week. Uh, the coefficient for intelligence is, intelligence is 8.22. Uh, associated with that coefficient, you have the standard error, 7.01, you have the T ratio, 1.17, and the P-value. Uh, the, the constant, I forgot to say, right, the standard error, 788, the T ratio, 126, the P-value, uh, 022. And then uh, extroversion, extroversion has a positive 49.71. T statistics, T ratio is two, positive 2.53. As you know, that is the ratio between the coefficient and the standard error. Uh, the P value, 0 0.02, okay? And then we have the rest, you know, the mean uh, dependent variable, sum of square residual, uh, and the, the R square, uh, the F statistics, the, the P value of the F statistics, you have all those statistics there, okay? Uh, but let's look at the analysis of variance, the ANOVA table, okay? Uh, remember, uh, we have now the sum of square uh, uh, regression, okay? Uh, that's the, in the first column. And then you have the regression, sum of square regression, sum of square residual as we explained before, and sum of square total. So of course the sum of square total is the sum of the sum of square regression plus the sum of square residual, the error sum of square. You have the degree of freedom. <clears throat> Remember we said that if you have N observations, uh, degree of freedom uh, would usually be N minus one. So here uh, you have, um, uh, 20 observations, the degree of freedom is 19. Okay, so applying the same methodology as before, we can calculate the R statistics, the R square, I'm sorry, the R square as 0 0.35, right? Is that what we have here? That's what we have in the, uh, in the results that came from the model, R square is 0 0.35. And we can calculate the same, through the same methodology, uh, calculate the F statistics, okay, to be 4.63, okay? So again, that is the F statistic where we go from the results from 4.63. The P value uh, of the S statist F statistics is 0 0.02, okay? Uh, that is close enough to zero Okay, 0 0.02 uh, to, of course, uh, just through these numbers to be able to uh, deduct, to conclude that overall, overall that this is a good fit. It's not, it's not, it's not completely small, completely uh, close to zero, it's 0 0.02, so there's some, uh, amount of uh, perhaps things that we are not capturing as much, but overall the F statistic is showing uh, a pretty good uh, general fit uh, of the model. And what I'm saying, my little doubts that I'm expressing, you can see from the R square, the R square is 0.35. Uh, remember it's the proportion of the, uh, uh, the changes, right, in uh, the dependent variable that uh, that as explained explained by the model, 
uh, when we take it as a proportion of the total. Okay, so the sum of square regression, okay, as a proportion of the total sum of square. Okay, when you say that, so it's saying, okay, how much of the variations uh, of the variations in the dependent variable, okay, that you can essentially say, oh, this is due to all the uh, exogenous variables that I include in the model. It's 0 0.35. So it's, it's, it's positive, it's not close to zero, but it's not uh, 0 0.5, it's not 0 0.6, it's not 0 0.7. So it's not the highest at the on the highest uh, end of the spectrum. The spectrum being zero to one, uh, but it is also it is it is uh, indicating that there is a, uh, a good proportion, zero point three five percent, of uh, the uh, variations in the dependent variable being explained within the model. All right. So let's test for uh, normality, okay? So remember, we, well, that's one of the assumptions that we make is normal normality, normal distribution. So the null hypothesis, uh, the same approach that we expressed, expressed before, um, the null hypothesis is that the error, uh, the error um, uh, is normally, distributed, so the errors are normally distributed, that the distribution of the error term, okay, is a normal distribution. That's our null hypothesis. We will apply the same uh, approach. So if you want, in this case, the alternative hypothesis will say, I know uh, the uh, error terms are not, are not normally distributed, okay? Now, in this case, for the normal distribution, what we use is called chi-square, okay? The test statistics, you can see it in the figure, okay? It's called chi-square, okay? The chi-square uh, is generated by the, um, the package, the, the, the regression analysis package. So in this case, the chi-square is 0 0.01, et cetera, okay? Okay, so we know the chi-square is 0 0.01, but we don't know if it's uh, significant or not. So in this case, the p-value uh, tells us a lot, okay? Uh, again, you can see in the bracket in the figure, the p-value is 0 0.994, et cetera. So 0 0.994, uh, for a p-value is very high, right? It's almost, uh, that's almost one. And remember, we said that p-value uh, for uh, hypothesis testing, the smaller the p-value, the more likely it is that uh, you will, uh, the probability Right, that you will reject the null hypothesis is true, is, is high. Okay, so in this case, the p value is very high, 0.99, and therefore we cannot reject the null hypothesis. What is the null hypothesis? The null hypothesis is that the error terms are normally distributed. That's our null hypothesis. We cannot reject that null hypothesis. So we can proceed with that assumption of normality. Okay, we cannot reject it on the basis of these numbers. So therefore, uh, we can proceed the analysis uh, uh, with the assumption of normal distribution of the error terms. Heteroscedasticity, okay. Um, in that case, the, uh, the broch Bakpagan test, for heteroscedasticity, okay? Uh, the null hypothesis is that there is not heteroscedasticity. There is not, right? Heteroscedasticity is not crisis. That's our null hypothesis. 
what is our test statistics. Uh, uh, see here you have them, uh, the uh, LM statistics here is called, is uh, 1.46, the uh, likelihood, the maximum likelihood uh, at test here. The p-value, okay, and so here, you even uh, when you look at the the uh, the residuals, right? So the residuals uh, versus the fitting. Remember that uh, we need to be able to detect a pattern uh, to be able to suspect heteroscedasticity. When you look at the figure of the residual versus the fitted, we, we, we went through that in the first part of the lesson. If you are not detecting, and I don't see a, here a particular pattern, a particular shape, right? So uh, it looks like what you would expect in terms of uh, uh, homo elasticity, and the results are showing that, that in terms of the p-value being 0 0.48 of the resulting uh, chi-square, okay, uh, that we can't, we cannot reject the null hypothesis of, uh, of no heteroscedasticity. The numbers show it, the statistics show it, the indicators show it, and the figures, the figure here also show it. There's no particular pattern in the way that the residuals uh, are, um, uh, show the, the, the spread of the residuals in this uh, particular uh, in this particular estimated results, okay? So we can proceed with the assumption of homo scedasticity. Uh, what about multicollinearity? Remember we talked about the variance inflation factor, okay? Uh, and so we said that the, when the values uh, begin to approach 10 or greater than 10, uh, you have uh, multicollinearity problem. In this, uh, our example, uh, the VIF for intelligence, both intelligence and extroversion uh, turned out to be 1.038. Uh, so uh, we can't uh, say that there is multicollinearity in this model. And the, the values are very far from 10, okay? And so we can proceed with the assumption uh, based on this test with the assumption of no multicollinearity. All right. And so um, the, if we go back to the model after we have gone through those tests, okay, what this is telling me here uh, is that it's an overall good fit. The assumptions, uh, we tested for the assumptions actually, and, uh, and therefore uh, we have not been able to reject uh, any of our assumptions based on our test. So now let's look at the results, the results, okay? Uh, think about the, the hypothesis testing that we performed for the coefficients. And if you look at the, uh, your T ratio in this case for intelligence, T ratio for intelligence, 1.17. Uh, if I even take the, let's go back uh, a bit uh, here. If I, if I even take the 5% significance level of 1.96, 5% significance level 1.96, and I have the results of T statistic being 1.17, okay? That is, that is much below 1.96, and therefore I cannot reject the null hypothesis that uh, beta one is zero. In other words, I cannot reject the null hypothesis that there is no relationship between sales week and intelligence. It, it, it's not there. The p-value is 0.25, and 0.25 is very high in terms of p-values. Remember, the, the, the smaller, the closer to zero, the better for 
uh, rejecting such null hypothesis. So it, it looks like the model is saying that there is no significant relationship. Now, remember the, the coefficient is positive, right? It's 8.22, it's not zero. Is is positive 8.22? Yet we are seeing, and we can test, and we can we can uh, uh, deduct that that 8.22, notwithstanding, is still the case that uh, the uh, the coefficient is not significantly different from zero. It's, it's not significant. Okay. Now let's look at extroversion. Extroversion, the coefficient is 49.71. The t-statistics is 2.53. Let's go back to uh, our uh, uh, hypothesis testing, okay? The t-statistics that we uh, see here is 2.53. So keep that in mind, 2.53. And if you go back to the hypothesis testing, the critical value, the critical value for 5% is 1.96. The critical value for 1% is 2.58. So when I compare 2.53, what I see is that it is greater than 1.96 in absolute term, but it's not, uh, it's not equal is less than 2.58. After all, it's 2.53. So therefore, I can say that uh, the, uh, the, the, the variable extroversion has a significant and positive relationship with sales week at the 5% level, but not at 1%. 5% is, is acceptable. That's why, you, by the way, you have the two stars there. It indicates five uh, percent significance level that again generated from the package. Okay, uh, if it's three stars, that's one percent. If it's one star, usually it's ten percent. So here we can say because the T ratio is two point five three, it's greater than one point nine six, but not as much as two point uh, two point five eight for one percent. So we, we do have though, at the 5% significance level, a positive uh, relationship between uh, extroversion and uh, sales week. What it means is that in terms of our economic analysis, that uh, those employees that are extrovert uh, have a more high, a higher impact a more highly significant impact, right? Those employees that are, are extrovert, intelligence notwithstanding, intelligence not, notwithstanding, those employees that are extrovert have a more highly significant impact on weekly sales and performance. Than, than those employees that are intelligent, but not extrovert. So intelligence alone, right, does not have any impact, impact on sales week. That's what this is saying. But you add extroversion and you have significant impact. This is what our example uh, is telling us in this particular case. All right. Now, I have been talking about um, the variables included in the model, the exogenous variables. Uh, we, we talked about uh, how we should go about making sure there is not multicollinearity. Um, we, uh, we want to make sure that the variables are highly, uh, or at least in terms of our assumptions and our uh, uh, the, 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 the modeling concept, that the var variables that we choose uh, 
uh, on the right hand side of the model are highly uh, correlated with the dependent variable, but that there is no high correlation among among the um, uh, the exogenous variables themselves. So the question, the next question is, how do you select those variables? Right. So this issue of model model specification and model selection. Okay. So this is trying to uh, specify the quote unquote best model to explain the relationship between a dependent variable and uh, a set of explanatory variables. Okay. What is the best quote unquote model to explain that relationship? Uh, but best here means what? It means that you want a model that is simple to understand, that is uh, parsimonious, okay? Parsimonious means that you should only include those variables that uh, really add value to the model, you understand? So that you don't just go, uh, if you're trying to explain uh, uh, the production of olive oil in North Africa, uh, right? So then you include all the variables, including some spots observed in France or in yeah, right some spots. Um, I you know how 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 would that explain? I mean okay I mean okay you can observe some spots in Russia in the United States that's data, but we are trying to explain uh, uh, the production of olive oil in the Middle East in let's say a country in, in North Africa, uh, and so some spots in uh, uh, observations all right, in Europe or in America does not really help that. Um, land and uh, fertilizer and uh, other inputs that go into the production, rain, you know, those kinds of things, okay, may, uh, in, in that particular location, right, might explain. So you can include all of the sunspots and every, everything, but, you know, those may not add value. So the model has to be parsimonious. Include, uh, select the variables that are the most likely to add value to the model. But at the same time, you don't want to make the mistake of leaving out significant variables. So the model has to be also robust, okay? In terms of explaining the changes in the dependent variable, which is what we want to be able to do. So generally, you should base your uh, model specification on economic theory, okay? Generally. Um, there are times once you're used to modeling and exercising uh, these uh, methodologies, uh, you develop some expertise, some instinct, and then you can sort of uh, decide, even if this, this variable is not significant, I know that it, it adds some value and I will include it or I will exclude it. Uh, and so in that way, model selection is as much a science, theory-based, conceptual-based, as much as it is an art where your own instinct and expertise and experience might uh, lead you to uh, include or exclude uh, one or another uh, variable, explanatory variable, okay? All right, so uh, as I said, overall specification, model specification, has to do once you know which variable you want to explain the dependent variable, uh, it's, it has to do with determining which independent variables you would want to include or exclude from the model. Okay, 
Now, so you want to be careful when you are going through the process of a model specification. Uh, for example, not to include too few exogenous variables. Uh, you might have all the instinct and uh, experience and so on, but you know, economic theory is still economic theory, right? Um, and so, I mean, yeah, yeah. some people might say, you know, uh, going to school, uh, by my experience going to school and getting an education has nothing to do with uh, how much you earn, okay? Later on in life, that's my experience, that's my instinct and so on. So you can build a model that doesn't include education uh, uh, or uh, in any case training, okay? Well, that might be fine. But most likely uh, from theory, from uh, what we can conceptualize, right? Uh, education, training, and so on, uh, most likely in a modern economy have a significant impact on earnings, um, uh, at least in terms of hypothesis, in terms of theory. And so if from right off you exclude uh, you're trying to explain uh, earnings, wage earnings, and then right off the bat, you exclude education and training because you think that, oh, you know, I know a lot of people who don't have any education who make a lot of money. Uh, that should be something that you should test for, uh, you know, from a theoretical perspective. And so in that case, your model would be underspecified and your estimation will be biased, uh, called omitted variable bias, okay? So when relevant uh, variables are excluded. So in my case, in a modern economy, um, earnings would be thought of in terms of theory to be um, related to your uh, level of training and education. You might have too many exogenous variable uh, in the model, uh, you know, so you might include uh, whether or not the person uh, has traveled in an earnings model uh, to the moon or not. <laughs> and so that could be uh, over specified the, uh, the model, right? So, uh, okay, that's fine. You can, you know, in this age of uh, uh, space travel, private space travel, maybe you can, you can include that. But at the end of the day, that is uh, not adding any value. And so that would be over specifying uh, the, uh, the model in that case, right? So you also want to be careful in terms, as I have been saying, in terms of multicollinearity. So don't choose variables that are too uh, correlated to each other too much, highly, uh, degree of high degree of correlation among those uh, variables. So if you do that, then uh, the model, uh, the significance, statistical significance becomes a problem. You cannot determine which one is uh, really affecting the, uh, to the, the, defend, the dependent variable to a certain degree, significance, uh, statistical significance speaking. And so, uh, and of course, the functional form, is it linear, is it quadratic, is it a log linear, uh, that type of thing. You know, so you also, uh, for example, by looking at the visual graphic of the data, that would also inform which type of uh, form, function, uh, which function of form you will specify. So, um, what are the, the ways to, in terms of now indicators, because everything here has to do, right? You have to be able sort of to measure uh, your, and be able to sustain and uh, defend uh, the decisions that you've made, right? So the first thing is um, look at, when you look at different iterations of the model, 
So you are including variables and you are excluding variables. Okay, and you are including and you are excluding. You want to be able to sort of get to a, a model that you are satisfied with, that you know uh, is robust, that you know is parsimonious, that you know has the appropriate variables from a theoretical perspective, okay, uh, that you would expect. And that, you know, sometimes your experiences would lead you to include or exclude uh, uh, as long as you pay attention to also uh, make sure that the, the theories, the theory, economic theory is well adhered to. Okay, so you can use the R square or the what's known as the adjusted R square. Adjusted R square uh, is, uh, is given directly by the, um, uh, the, the model package and it's, it's adjusted in the sense that it is corrected for the number of um, exogenous variables in the model. You know, normally the more you add the exogenous variables, the higher the R square goes up. Um, just by the fact that you add in, because every exogenous variable will explain a little bit whatever it is, some kind of relationship. This is just the way that uh, statistics works. Um, so yeah, you may actually have the, you see that sunspot observations in the United States uh, had some relationship with uh, olive oil production in the Middle East, actually. Uh, but uh, the adjusted R square corrects for the number uh, takes into account the number of uh, variables in the model. So we tend to use the adjusted version of the R squared. The T statistics, uh, we have seen that, uh, so that you would want to include, generally speaking, the variables that have the most uh, statistically significant T statistics, um, or at least those that have statistically significant T statistics. Uh, so the, that's when the p-value uh, is less than the significance levels, the critical values of the significance level, as we saw with the hypothesis testing. Uh, sometimes you might include, as I said before, some one or two variables that you think are important and they don't have statistical uh, significance, but you still want to include them. That depends on the art now of uh, regression analysis. Okay, you can look at also the, uh, the error uh, sums of square. And so the ones, the model that you want to select would be the one that minimize the error sums of square, right? You wanna make sure that <laughs> you minimize, right? How much error, uh, how much unexplained, right, portion of the, you want to minimize the amount of unexplained variation in the um, dependent variable. So if you have several models that you are looking at, uh, that would be one of the, so high adjusted R square, uh, significant test statistics, uh, minimum uh, uh, error square, uh, some, of, some of the squares. Yeah. Key information criterion, okay, it's also another model selection tool. Uh, it looks at, for this to work, you have kind of have to have several different uh, uh, models, alternative, alternative models. And then you look at, you evaluate how well one model compares to another, to alternatives, okay? Uh, and so, uh, the archaic information criterion is based on the assumption that the best fit model is the one that explains the greatest amount of variation using parsimony, using the fewest possible independent variables. That's the, that's the, um, those are the assumptions behind, right, this methodology. And so you would want the lower AIC, archaic information criterion, uh, you know, in terms of uh, the, the, 
better fit model. So, so you want low AIC, high adjusted R square, significant test statistics, low minimum error square, summer square, and low or lower, lower compared to others, other alternatives, lower uh, EKIK information criterion. Those are the, the uh, some of the ways that you would look at when you are including, when you're including variables in the model, uh, those are the indicators that you would be considering in terms of choosing or selecting uh, a model that you would be satisfied with. So here we have different models uh, and that we'll try to, to compare those, uh, just, just those indicators and we'll look at them across, okay? Um, so you have the model one. This is a model that is trying to explain Nigeria maize production, okay? Uh, uh, and so the dependent variable here is production of maize, okay? Um, this don't quote this at all. These are just examples. They are not uh, published numbers. They are not any numbers that you can go and quote anywhere in any, uh, in any forum uh, at all. I just want to make sh uh, sure that you understand this. This is not published work. These are numbers uh, that are used just for training purposes only and only that, please. And so uh, in the, the first model, okay, uh, includes fertilizers, fertilizer only, right? So the, the, you have the, in that first column, uh, you have the uh, various exogenous variables that you could include in the model that you could include. So you have, of course, the constant is always there. You have fertilizer, you have uh, agriculture credit, uh, you have the um, agriculture, this is uh, um, uh, uh, the price that is an in, in indicator of inflation. Okay, uh, uh, you have uh, crop land, okay. Uh, here you have uh, uh, the, uh, the population, okay, rural population and you have exchange rates, okay? And so this is, this is, uh, this is the, the, the types of uh, variables that you can include in this particular example, okay? And um, the VA def is value added uh, deflator, okay? So that's, that's what that, that is saying there. So agriculture credit, fertilizer, Agricultural area added deflated crop land, uh, rural population exchange rate. Those are the different possible possible uh, combinations of uh, exogenous variables that you could enter into this model. The the Y in the model, the dependent variable is production of maize. Okay. Again, purely an example. Model one includes only fertilizer. Model two includes only uh, agricultural credit. Model three includes only uh, the agricultural value added deflator. Model four includes only cropland. Model five includes only the rural, rural population. And six, model six includes only uh, exchange rate. In parentheses, in this presentation, in this table, the numbers in parentheses indicate the T statistics, okay, of each variable included, all right? And then you have at the bottom, okay, a list of indicators, okay, to, to see how to evaluate each model. So if you look at model one, the fert fertilizer is the only um, variable included. So this is each one of these are uh, uh, uni, uh, 